Hello, everyone. Um, I welcome all on Data Phoenix webinar. Uh, today we will speak about Exiboost. Uh, we will uh, speak about um, fraud detection uh, and see how uh, you can uh, evaluate in Exiboost uh, for balance and imbalance data sets. Uh, with us today, uh, Gisel Valerda. Uh, she is a um, senior data scientist at uh, Vodafone, and she will share uh, her knowledge uh, about building AI fraud detection system. Um, before uh, I will give uh, for her the mic microphone, um, I want to say uh, that you can ask uh, during the webinar uh, your question uh, on Slanda, and uh, we will um, Mm, answer for them uh, on the end of the uh, her presentation. So for now, I give microphone to Gisel, uh, please. Thank you very much for organizing this talk and inviting me to present this work, uh, which is, as uh, Dimitri already said, uh, evaluating extra rules for balance and highly imbalanced data. And this can be used for fraud detection but also for all kinds of binary classifiers and, for example, for risk scoring as well. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. I started my career in 2000. I studied systems engineering. I worked in industry and academia. And in 2017, I finished my PhD in computer science and engineering. It was a machine learning uh, thesis where I was studying patterns uh, for music, for music uh, perceptual applications, actually not really related to fraud. But uh, the interesting relation perhaps is that uh, we, uh, we were studying how the brain works and how we process those patterns that help us understand music style or um, other types of um, patterns and structures and therefore in 2014 we submitted some pattern discovering algorithms that rank high at the Myrex, which is an international evaluation for music. Then I was teaching at UPB and I received a teaching award in 2021 for my lecture on selected topics in artificial intelligence. And I received already two uh, Vodafone Star Awards in 2021 and 2023 uh, because the model we developed with my team uh, is performing good. And we are going to see uh, the whole team that is uh, developing this work. We have uh, Michael Weihard, which is the head of department. Rafael Nigot is the product owner. Uh, Anindya, Sanjay, and Anush uh, help providing insights in previous implementations. And Anindya, Kushbu, and uh, Weibo provided the data collection for the experiments I'm going to show. The rest of the team is relatively new. They are mostly working on data pipelines, uh, but there are also some other machine learning applications. This talk is for you if you are interested, of course, in fraud detection, how can we solve it with machine learning? Also, if you care about accelerated data science, and if you ever faced the curse of imbalanced data sets, uh, because it's difficult with machine learning how to approach this uh, problem. And also, if you want to learn more about machine learning boosting systems and how this performance is related to the data. So we, we, are, we are going to see different experiments and how you can uh, tweak your models to perform uh, in the best possible way. In this presentation uh, I gave uh, some weeks ago at the NVIDIA conference. So I would like to share with you as well the insights uh, on it. Uh, but I hope that by the end of the talk, uh, you will uh, better understand how good can boosting systems work depending on the data you have. So it means the amount of data and also the distribution of the data. In this case, we are only going to talk about uh, binary classification problems. And also at the end of the talk, I'm going to share some um, uh, useful resources for you for further learning. So I hope you stay until the end. Just to uh, talk about the problem of fraud detection, 
uh, in the telecommunication, telecommunication sector, the sector I'm working uh, at the moment, um, the global revenue is about 1.8 trillion US dollars and loss due to fraud is about more than 2%. Uh, the different types of fraud that we see are equipment theft, commissions fraud, and device reselling. There are many other types of fraud activities, uh, but those are the ones that uh, we mainly are interested in detecting. This image is just to frame the problem of uh, trying to identify what is real and what is not real. So if you consider, for example, this tiger, and you would have to tell if this is a real cat or not, how about the next picture? Oh, sorry. Uh, would you think that the next one is a simulated tiger or a real one? And how about the last one? So maybe you want to do the exercise for yourself and think which of these three images is the real and which one is the fake one. This is one of the problems that we face. Of course, in our case, it's not about images, it's about data. But uh, fraudsters try to simulate the behavior of real customers and they try to uh, provide all the features like they were a good customer while they are not good customers. So that's the problem in uh, fraud detection. So people uh, invent clever ways to try to fool the system and try to appear as if they are really uh, good customers. Let's talk also why fraud detection is hard or risk scoring. So fraudsters continue, continuously change their behavior. They, uh, again, are trying different strategies to fool the system. They may represent rare cases, and this is a problem for machine learning because uh, as we will see, the problems of imbalance uh, is not so easy to solve. Another problem is that fraud patterns may even be unseen during training. So it means because fraudsters are continuously changing their behavior, uh, then they may invent new patterns. Or for example, if you have new products which have been never launched to the market, so the reaction will be also difficult to understand until you really launch something. And finally, one of the problems also in fraud detection is that fraud may occur uh, with a time delay, let's say a, a customer uh, asks for a product and maybe this person pay for one month, two months, and then stops paying. And so you will not identify that this person was doing fraud until uh, several months later on. Or for example, uh, yeah, you have some customers that immediately take the product and get away. So it is not so easy to know when your label will be correctly set. And that's, of course, a challenge for machine learning as well. Which industries are affected by fraud? Of course, telecommunication sector, finance, e-commerce, and automotive. So indeed, uh, any company that has to sell products or services or give a credit or a loan, they could be affected by either fraud or either customers that are not so really good customers so that they will pay for a couple of months, but they will not really finish to pay their loan or the credit. In the case of machine learning, we are going to treat this as a binary classification problem, either good customer or bad customer. So for our case, the, the fraudsters or bad customers are the positive class and they are the ones that we are really interested to spot. And this is because um, most of the businesses, most of the businesses live from the negative classes. So negative are the good customers that are bringing uh, money to your business. And the positive class are the ones that are harming the business. And therefore, you are more interested to spot those which are bad customers. Let's talk about how we are going to evaluate the detection systems before we enter into machine learning directly. Um, and this is maybe one of the uh, funny contours that you all know about confusion matrices, but just for recap, uh, we would consider that we have uh, an actual class 
uh, which it has positive and negative samples, and we would have the predicted from our machine learning. In this case, um, this patient is going to the doctor and the doctor is telling you are pregnant and this woman is indeed pregnant. So this is a, posit a true positive. But the doctor could make a mistake and could say you are not pregnant while this woman is indeed pregnant. And this is a type of false negative. In this corner, we would see the true negative. So the doctor would say you're not pregnant and in, indeed this person is not pregnant. So this is a true negative. And also we are interested in this type of uh, mistake, which is the false positive, uh, where the doctor will say you are pregnant, but indeed this person is not pregnant. Depending on the application, the mistakes we do, either false positives or false negatives could be relevant. You could tweak your model to give more weight to uh, do less false positive errors or less false negative errors. What is the case? For example, uh, if we're not talking about risk scoring, but let's say a patient is going to a doctor uh, and the patient, the doctor is scanning for cancer. So the doctor would prefer to send the patient to another test to be sure that this person will not develop cancer because it's very costly if a patient develops cancer. So the, the doctor would say, okay, it's not a problem to send again this patient for a checkup. Um, and then uh, in another context, you would say, no, we'd prefer not to block customers. So we would prefer to uh, leave all customers in, even if we have um, this number of uh, fraudsters identified. So depending on uh, your application, you can decide what you prefer better to minimize or maximize. Let's look it into the numbers. So this is just what we were talking about, true positives, uh, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. The question is, of course, if your data is in balance and the evaluation will change according to that. So the evaluation matters and the class distribution of the data matters a lot. Uh, and the evaluation measures behave differently under balance and imbalanced data sets. This is important to consider. Let's say if we have a balanced data set, for example, a positive and negative class. And of course, uh, machine learning is not perfect. So you will have um, your classifier uh, giving some results. And those which are in this uh, range are those which are false positives and false negatives. But if your data is unbalanced, so this may change. And you may have a different configuration. So. What can you use to evaluate your data? Maybe you can take a look at the confusion matrix, which is always very good to see how this behaves. You could use the area under the precision uh, recall curve instead of uh, the area under the curve a ROC. And although you will see a lot of publications using the ROC curve, uh, I invite you to read this paper from Saito Remshmaya that uh, demonstrate that the error C curve really is uh, deceiving when you have imbalanced data. So it would not be advisable to look at that. You could also look at precision at N. So how precise is your model at N samples? And what we usually take is the F1 score. You could also decide if you want F0.5 or F2. I'm going to talk about this in detail in a minute. You could use the Matthew correlation coefficient uh, you could use false positives and false positive rates. And you could also introduce revenue or cost. So how much uh, is costing a mistake for your system? And of course, you could care about time. How fast is your model? In our case, uh, we prefer to use precision and recall because we can train the models based on this measure. And at the end, we can also uh, use F1 to uh, see how good is the model behaving. When you have a class balance or imbalance, a baseline to compute is always this PRC, which will be the fraction of your positives divided by the positives and negatives. Uh, you could consider that the positive class is giving you uh, an idea on how, uh, how good can your model perform from the baseline, just from the distribution of your data. In precision, it's just important to recap that uh, 
if false positives are penalizing your precision. So if your false positives increase, your precision will go down. And in, in case of recall, if you have more of the false negative mistakes, again, your recall will go down, right? Uh, for the S-score, as I was saying before, this is a combination between precision and recall. And you can use F0.5 if you care more about precision. So you would like a system which is more precise and do less uh, um, false positives, or you would care more about F2 and uh, you would care more about recall. So you, you prefer even to make some uh, mistakes, but it's, it's fine for your system. Accuracy is a measure that nobody will recommend to use, even though you are using all the uh, numbers here, true positives and true negatives from the confusion matrix. And we are going to see some examples why you should not use accuracy. Let's consider this example uh, where we have uh, 500 negatives and 500 positives. So in this case, this is a balanced data set. And let's assume that this classifier makes the uh, same number of mistakes. I hope you can see my mouse, but I'm pointing out the false negatives and false positives mistakes, so 166 for each case. And we will see that precision, uh, recall, and F1 score, because we are doing the same amount of mistakes, is giving us 0 0.5. So this measure goes from 0 to 1. Accuracy is telling us this is about 0 0.67, and the baseline is also 0 0.5 because we have the same number of negatives and positives. But if we change the distribution, and I'm pointing at example number two, um, we would have, for example, 900 uh, negatives and just 100 positives. And let's consider again, we have the same number of mistakes, 50 false negatives and 50 false positives. Um, precision and recall, again, stay at 0 0.5. And of course, the measures that I derive from precision and recall, F1, F0.5, and F0, uh, sorry, and F2 are also at uh, 0 0.50. But accuracy is telling us that this is a good model, so 0 0.90 which it's not true, right? And this is the bias that we are seeing uh, on the data. So we have this 900 and therefore accuracy is telling us, well, this is 90% uh, accurate. So that's why we should not use accuracy. In another example, let's consider a classifier that flags everything as negative. So this would be a kind of blind classifier because it's not really learning anything, just everything will be flagged as negative. We are not able to compute precision, and of course not of the F scores. Recall would be zero, but accuracy is telling us, oh, this is a great classifier, 90%, right? So that's another uh, way to demonstrate that accuracy is very deceiving. Uh, another example, uh, let's say this classifier flags everything as positive and has high recall but low precision. And in this case, uh, we have seen some classifiers that um, could give you all as um, uh, uh, recall one, but your precision will be low. So your F1 score is, of course, going down, right? In this case, your accuracy is also 0 0.10. Finally, let's consider a last example. So you would have a classifier with high precision but low recall. This is also possible. Um, in this case, for example, you will have uh, 95 false negatives and zero false positives. So it's very precise. Your precision is one, but your recall is 0 0.05. So maybe you can uh, decide, okay, uh, I'm retrieving, uh, I'm, I'm not making false positive mistakes that therefore my precision is high, but I retrieve only five uh, true positives, which is uh, little. So you can decide if this classifier works for you. Okay, now let's move on to why uh, we would like to select XGBoost uh, or extreme gradient boosting for our experiments. Uh, based on literature review, you will see that XGBoost uh, really performs good and not, not, there is not so much 
uh, in the literature, but there is more empirical evidence. There are many competitions in Kaggle that demonstrate that XGBoost is really good and also is very fast. So I advise you to look at it. It's, uh, it's really charming to work with it. Um, this is ensemble of decision trees and actually the algorithm, it's very nice. Uh, in the first pass, it will create a simple decision tree with all the data it has. And then it will iterate over M number of trees. So you can decide the number of M and it will build a tree selecting those samples that were misclassified in the previous tree and just focus creating a tree. And then we'll pass to the next tree, again, focusing on those that were misclassified and so on and so forth. Uh, this is similar, Andrew and G says that this is similar to le learning to play the piano. So you play one, uh, one time the whole piece, and then you focus only on the mistakes until you master that and you go to the next um, place where you practice again and again and again. So that, that is one thing you can remember about ensemble of trees. This would be a schematic example of a tree ensemble model with two trees and the decision nodes are oval and the leaf nodes are rectangular and each uh, tree contributes to the final prediction. That's more or less an example on how you can uh, visualize uh, the decisions that trees are taking. In the literature review, uh, we consider this uh, research um, where they were using a synthetic data set with uh, 6 million attributes, uh, sorry, 6 million samples and nine attributes. And they were using train and test, so 75%, 25 for the testing. And they use uh, five-fold cross-validation and they tested different algorithms. So they tested uh, some supervised approaches like KNN, support vector machines, random forest, and XGBoost. Uh, you can see that XGBoost is the best performing in terms of F1 score. Uh, the second one will be random forest. But if you look at the execution time, so uh, XGBoost is much faster. The authors also tested unsupervised uh, approaches, including XGBot, which is actually the best performing, if you see. Uh, but XGBot, if you want to run um, this algorithm, you will need to provide the labels. So in this case, you would consider this as really a, also a supervised learning algorithm, and it's uh, very, very slow. Um, some interesting maybe algorithms to test are uh, based on GANs, uh, which are uh, these ones, which as you can see, none of the unsupervised learning approaches can outperform supervised learning. And also uh, the time is important. From boosting systems, there are the, the different approaches. So which boosting system you can choose? Uh, this is uh, a graph from the authors of XGBoost, and they compare, uh, for example, H2O, Spark, and XGBoost. You can see that XGBoost uh, is the fastest. So he, you, here you have the number of training examples in millions. And also this would be the iteration cost exclude data loading. So again, uh, H2O is close to XGBoost, but XGBoost is the fastest. Um, also, this is from the authors of the paper. They compared XGBoost and XGBoost has different um, configurations and, uh, for example, different algorithms that would uh, be not available from other implementations. Uh, for example, one that was interesting for us is the sparsity aware because um, some of the data is uh, not present. So that would be really interesting for, a, for us also parallel computing. Um, and the other uh, algorithms are depending on how uh, the algorithm is selecting the data in columns or rows. If you're training in a GPU and a CPU, you can see how fast uh, could be your uh, GPU versus a CPU. And I think this publication is from 2017. 
And I heard that even this year, you would have even faster times if you train with a GPU. In this example, uh, I just wanted to compare how fast is GPU and uh, CPU. So if you train it with GPU, uh, you would have an increase in speed about three to six, six times faster. So you can also uh, test it with GPU. Now let's go for the experiments that we did, and maybe this is the, the main dish of this talk. So in the first experiment, we were considering 50-50 uh, distribution. So I have a large data set and um, I was taking 100,000 samples and I sampled it so to have 50-50 distribution. And then I took a small subsample uh, with just 10,000 examples and another even smaller of 1,000 samples. Uh, the data set that we have is a private data set with 150 features. And then I also sampled the data, so to have uh, from 50-50 distribution, and then trying to uh, lower the distribution of positives so that we will have 45%, 25%, and 5%. So from a balanced scenario to a highly imbalanced scenario. And uh, this was done also for all data sets, so from 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000. And the pipeline I developed was uh, first, all the numerical data scale between zero and one. Uh, when you see uh, talks about XGBoost or maybe some papers about XGBoost, uh, you would usually read that it's not necessary to scale because of the nature of the algorithm. Usually when you are working with deep learning and images, for example, it's always a must to scale your data to put it always in, for example, the range zero to one. But for XGBoost, uh, it's not always recommended. In my experiments, I have seen that uh, for small data sets, it doesn't make uh, any difference. But if you have large data sets, you are doing much better if you are scale uh, between zero and one. And another thing that comes into the pipeline is that uh, the categorical data uh, goes under an ordinal encoder such that values and CNG and training receive a reset value. This means, for example, you have, in our case, we could have uh, um, different phone types like iPhone, Samsung, and so on and so forth. Um, and you encode those uh, from, for example, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. But let's say in the future comes a new phone that it was not created in the past. So this new uh, category will take a reserve value of minus one. So that's something that you cannot know what will occur in the future. So that's one way to encode the data for unseen data. How you uh, now train your XGBoost? You simply import from XGBoost, import XGBoost classifier. This would be a vanilla XGBoost, a very simple one. And uh, the objective will be a binary logistic uh, missing one. This will activate uh, sparseness in your data. This, if you want to reproduce the results, the evaluation metrics is uh, the curve PRC, what we were discussing at the beginning. And if you want to test it with GPU, what you need to do is um, three method GPU hist. If you leave this blank, then you will be training on CPU. With the vanilla XGBoost, and there are here many uh, results. I hope you can focus. Uh, I was using 80% uh, and 20% for train test. Uh, important is that uh, with a small data set, you can uh, perform well. So 80% F1 score. And of course, you see, as the data becomes more imbalanced, the uh, exhibits will have hard time uh, with uh, the performance. Uh, let's say we have uh, 10,000 samples. Again, you see that exhibits performs uh, very good um, with the F1 score when the data is balanced. So we have here the percentage of the positive class. So 50%, 45, 25, and 5%. Uh, the results will improve a little bit, but you see uh, this um, drop in performance. And of course, if you have a larger data set, your results will also improve. But um, again, you see this drop, although uh, 
the amount of data will help you with the imbalance. What is the difference between a vanilla and a randomized uh, search over following parameters? So um, we were searching over the space of these parameters where uh, the max depth, so this means how many trees we have. Uh, the default vanilla will give you six uh, trees and then you can test it with different numbers. So three, six, 12, and 20. Uh, the learning rate, again, how fast your algorithm will learn. The default is 0 0.3, we tested with these values. Uh, Subsample is with the, the amount of data you, will, you are going to train and collapse by three is which columns will select XGBoost to train as well. So this is to prevent overfitting. Uh, sorry, the max depth is the, the, uh, the depth of your tree and uh, estimators is how many trees you are building. So the default are uh, 100 trees and we tested also with 100,000 and 5,000. Why uh, we selected these parameters and not others? Well, I was reading that uh, a winning Kaggle submission used uh, some of these uh, patterns to train their algorithms. So that's why we were selecting those in this space. I don't know if I'm going further. Uh, so the random XGBoost, uh, random search tune XGBoost improves a little bit the data, but this is not consistent when you have a small data set. You, we are going to see a comparison um, that uh, only the largest data set will improve uh, with this uh, fine tuning. So again, this is a comparison, but I think I'm going to switch to the images, uh, which are much better. So in this case, on the left, we see the vanilla, uh, performance, so without no um, fine tuning. And on the right, we see the random search tune XGBoost with the parameters I showed. And we see uh, a an, an small improvement and the colors you have here, the blue one is uh, the smallest data set. The orange is the medium data set and uh, green is the largest data set. Um, there is a small improvement when you have a large data set uh, consistent, but when the data set is small, there is almost no, no improvement. So for the largest data set of 100,000 samples, uh, again, the blue here would be the vanilla XGBoost and the orange is the random search tune XGBoost. Uh, you see a small consistent improvement in all cases. So here we have 50%, um, so completely balanced data set. And this is the highly imbalanced data set, right? So maybe if you are facing problems with imbalance, so fine tuning uh, can help you if you have a large data set. The next experiment was to see how can we then help XGBoost to improve on the most critical range, which is the 5% positives. And therefore, uh, I was thinking maybe we can uh, train the XGBoost sampling to have uh, the train set with 50-50 and test it with the normal distribution. Uh, so again, if we had uh, this distribution, 50% and 45% positives, again, try to balance the train set and see what happens. And we will repeat this procedure for uh, the 25%. And again, for the 5% positive. So again, trying to balance the train set with a 50-50 distribution. Let's see what happens. Actually, um, the results, uh, maybe we can concentrate on the F1 score. And um, the results become unrealistic. So your, your uh, F1 score um, estimated, we tell you, Yes, the XGBoost uh, is performing good, uh, around 80. But when you test it uh, on your test set, then these results uh, deteriorate. And one other observation is that your recall will improve while your precision will worsen. And actually, we would not prefer to uh, see this behavior. So we would prefer to maintain the classifier as precise as possible. So. Um, sampling, uh, random sampling to train the uh, extremes uh, really did not help uh, the results. Uh, this is again 
a table to see the comparison also from vanilla and uh, a random sample. And so what could be next steps? Uh, next steps are looking into graphs because we have seen some experiments uh, which promise uh, uh, improvements also on XGBoost. It seems like graphs can learn important connections and representations between the nodes and that could help for uh, detecting suspicious behaviors. Um, then uh, I wanted to review different methods for uh, imbalance learning. So there are different uh, approaches that could also help in the future to see into that. Uh, maybe deep learning and representation learning to try to find uh, better features for the models. And if you want to put these models into production, uh, we are talking to NVIDIA. So because you want to have the same performance that you are measuring uh, in uh, when you put the model into production. And it seems that Triton and Morpheus uh, from NVIDIA, which are open source, can help you monitor your models in an easy way. And now the promise resources. Uh, there is uh, this white paper which summarizes the experiments we have done. So if you uh, take a picture of uh, this QR code, you will go directly to the paper that reports all the experiments we have done. And this is my contact information as well if you would like to uh, know more. So now, uh, Dimitri, I think we can start with the questions. Yeah, uh, thank you for interesting presentation. Um, we have several questions. Uh, I will share the screen with the question. Uh, so if you also have question, please use the link under the video uh, or slander and uh, write your question there. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, one question about sharing this presentation. Um, yeah, we will share it um, with the video so you can use it. We will send you um, in next couple of days uh, update and the link for the recording of this video and the for the presentation. Uh, That's a good question. So what was the real positive rate of fraud in your problem? Um, uh, I cannot answer exactly this question, but I can give you a hint. We have seen different rates for, for different applications. That's why I was testing for different uh, distributions. Um, and I think there are also different uh, in different cases, you will see different distributions. I cannot answer exactly what was the, the, the real rate, but different applications have different distributions, yeah. Very good. Um, and about uh, applications of time for performance and evaluating metrics. Yes. So. Unfortunately, we are in a field of uh, fraud detection. So if I tell you which are the most important features, I'm risking the problem that uh, maybe someone who knows about this presentation could uh, know what we are using to, to spot uh, risky customers and could know, ah, maybe we change this behavior for this feature so we cannot use that. Therefore, that's why I cannot share exactly which features are most important, but XGBoost will, uh, for example, give you a ranking of the features when you uh, train your model and you can see in your case, which are the most important features. And if we match the expectations of subject matters, in some cases, yes. And actually we have a very large data set. So if you increase the number of um, sampling labels, oh, sorry, the sampling cases, uh, we have seen very, very nice results for some of the applications. So by increasing the, the performance. Uh, in other cases, the performance is not that good. And of course, experts are still uh, accept, skeptical, but it, it depends very much on the application. Yeah, uh, as I understand, you also say about important features. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, 
the use XBoost for so any other problems or business cases? Okay, the question is maybe uh, why you want to use XGBoost instead of deep learning? In cases where you have images, audio, or all those kinds of data representations, you maybe prefer deep learning. While if you have tabular data, you prefer XGBoost because it's much faster and performs very good on this kind of data. So depending on what data you have, you would prefer to use XGBoost or deep learning. Uh, did you use any over simpling and under simpling uh, methods? Yes, the only technique we used was uh, sampling the training set to equalize the number of uh, positives and negatives. So you can call it a mix of over sampling and under sampling. But unfortunately, this procedure did not work very well for us. Uh, some people suggested we could use we could tweak uh, some functions in XGBoost to maybe improve performance on the balanced data. So we are also interested in that part. Yeah, uh, someone missed a little uh, about uh, your methods, methodology uh, uh, for the inbound data sets. Can you yes. A little repeat. Actually, it is very simple what we have done. So we have a large data set. And from this large data set, I just sampled the data to have the, the number of positives and negatives that I wanted. Very simple as that. Only sampling to increase the number of positives or decrease the number of positives in this case. Oh, yeah, come, more one. More questions, okay. Um. Um, do you think it is wise approach to directly start with XGBoost for any imbalanced data set? Uh, the, maybe this relates to the previous question. So it depends on what kind of data you are dealing with. If it, if it is tabular data, I would suggest, yeah, go for XGBoost. But if you have images, text, audio, maybe you need to try deep learning. Um, how did you, uh, and also if you have labels, so that's also another constraint that you would need for XGBoost. If you have uh, a bunch of labels and as even a small data set can work for your problem, uh, then uh, you can use XGBoost, but maybe as the time passed by, you would also need to collect if your problem is changing over time. So that, that is also something to consider. How did you create the best option to increase your one in your problem? Uh, the best option to increase the positive sample. We just use a simple sample, sampling technique. So uh, that was the only thing we have done. Ah, or, or the question is, maybe uh, if you can go back, please, Dimitri, to the uh, previous question. <laughs> no, uh, sorry, I, I need to find them. Okay, well, maybe the question is how you improve uh, F1 score. I'm not so sure if that was the question. How to improve F1 score? You can use a random search for fine tuning over some parameters that we tested, and this can help you improve if you have enough data. If you don't have 100,000 samples, just a vanilla XGBoost will give you charming results. I hope I answered the question. Did you stratify cross-validation or regular cross-validation? I uh, don't remember this one, uh, but I think we use only regular cross-validation. I think we use that, yeah. Did you use ordinal encoding for all your categorical variables? Yes, for all of them, we use ordinal encoder, yes. What would be the best method of choosing features? Hmm. I would say, try to use all the features you can get from your data. <laughs> uh, and XGBoost will handle that for you. Uh, so as much data as possible. Sometimes you have constraints from the company that they want, they don't want to allow you to use some features which may seem relevant. So all the features you can get, uh, then try to use them. 
Thank you, Sam and Dr. Fornix, for a powerful presentation. Thanks a lot for Thank your you. attention. Yeah. yeah. I have seen oversampling of the minority class work well in the past. Why do you think it didn't work well in your use case? Uh, I don't know. Uh, in our case, it seems that it works because uh, the F1 score relatively still is stable. But when you inspect precision and recall, in our case, uh, recall increased and precision decreased. So if in your application, you prefer to have higher recall than precision, maybe this can help. In our case, that would not be advisable. So maybe it depends on the application and, and on the data as well. I, I really don't know the answer for that. Uh, if you don't have the target variable, which unsupervised approach is most preferred one? Um, yes, GANs seem to work fine. So GANs could be one approach to look at. Uh, autoencoders is another uh, popular approach, but it's difficult to learn the proper structure of, the, of your autoencoder. And sometimes you need some labels to know what is your negative class so that you don't uh, you don't have a mixture of data in your classes. So some information of the labels you would need also with autoencoders, but GANs autoencoders. Uh, how long it took for you the feature selection, creation, new variables to test them? This procedure was done by my colleagues. Uh, I think they took some years to develop the knowledge of which features can go into the model. Uh, we didn't uh, go into that direction at this stage, but that was something that it was uh, research uh, from, from my colleagues. So it can, it can take an, it, some time. Do you do a lot of feature engineering? Uh, I, there is a nice tutorial on feature engineering. Um, maybe I didn't share it today, but I can also share later, Dimitri. I can uh, add that to the presentation. Um, it seems it helps, but the improve is little. So you do a lot of feature engineering. It gives you some improvement, but it's very small. So uh, you can try that. Uh, that's something to, to try. Uh, we did not do that. How much history do you recommend for fraud? As, uh, as, much, <laughs> as much as possible. Okay. All the history you can get, uh, but that's difficult because collecting the labels is also expensive, I think. So as much uh, labels as you can get. But as you have seen, if you have a small data set could also work, hoping that in the future, uh, the, the patterns will not change much, right? Can the feature importance of XGBoost be biased toward features with high number of values? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know if uh, we have... Well, in this case, since we normalized, I don't think that would have an impact. Uh, so I don't think so, but uh, that would, would be something interesting to investigate. Uh, okay, uh, I think the question is ended. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, thank you for all that you was with us. Um, and see you on the next uh, webinars. Uh, we will have very interesting topic and we'll announce uh, shortly. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for this invitation and all the participants for the nice questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.